the presentation as a case study on a wonderful project done here in the Boston area called Finch Cambridge. Um, Zach's going to get the chance to go see that soon. Uh, so he'll be able to have more information on how that's working, uh, what, uh, probably two years now after the fact. Um, it doesn't feel like it's been two years since I did that project, but it was, it's, been a, it's been a little while. Uh, through that, we'll talk a little bit about the products that went into that, the services that went into that. Um, so it's a, it's a good marriage between you know, understanding some differences of high performance building envelopes from code building envelopes and uh, also learning a little bit about SEGA and what we do and, and, and how we can help uh, make these projects successful. So I will go ahead and um, get my screen up. All right. So that should be um, that should be set. So let's go through uh, the high performance multifamily building envelopes and how Finch Cambridge achieved its target, uh, well over achieved its target, uh, and achieved 0.39 ACH 50 uh, for that building envelope. As Zach said, I am Ken Kiefer. I am the director of High Performance Construction Academy here in Salem, New Hampshire, about uh, 30 minutes north of Boston. I also am the regional manager for the Eastern US uh, at SEGA. So I take care of, of all of my uh, award-winning team here on the Eastern side of the Mississippi River. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about who SEGA is, talk about high performance versus typical multifamily building envelopes, and then also how to plan for a high performance building envelope. And then we'll have, uh, as Zach said, time for some questions afterwards. So who are we? Who is SEGA? Uh, SI is for Sieber, GA is for Gadian. That is the last names of the owner's parents. Uh, that's how we got our name. We are a Swiss company who manufactures products that are for zero energy loss buildings. This is something that's near and dear uh, to the founders of our company's hearts. And the founders of the company is right here. This is Marco on the right, Reto on the left, in front of one of our two wonderful factories in uh, Switzerland. This one is in Roosville, the other is in Schachen. And uh, just so you know, we do put our money where our mouth is. Our Schachen facility produces 119% of the energy it consumes. So that factory is a net producer of energy. And this is where you will find SEGA. We are active in over 40 countries throughout the world. And Switzerland is that nice red country right there in the middle. Um, and this is how we do our business. We have three pillars of our business. The first being innovation. We research, develop all of our own products. We test them extensively and retest them extensively to ensure that they are still meeting today's demanding needs. We also manufacture our own products and we go so far as to engineer our own manufacturing equipment so that we can ensure the utmost quality control and highest quality products are delivered to the market. So we've done a great job of manufacturing and researching and developing, but none of that matters if people don't understand why and how. So that is a big part of what we do is education and training. It's why I run our facility here in Salem, New Hampshire. We have another facility in Vancouver in British Columbia. We have a facility in Oslo, Norway. And of course we have a facility at our factory in uh, Roosevelt. And that is not where we focus all of our training. We of course do on-site training and office training, uh, all types of educational opportunities within our organization. And with all that, we are a very, very focused manufacturer. We manufacture membranes, adhesives, and sealants and primers. And that is what we do. And we do it, as far as I'm concerned, better than anyone else in the world. All right, so let's talk about high performance versus typical multifamily building envelopes. So the first thing we'll take a look at is what you would typically see in a standard code construction model. As you can see here, we've got probably some vinyl siding, uh, whatever building wrap is the least expensive off the shelf 
at the at the home centers um, and then expensive wood sheathing probably two by six studs with with fiberglass bad insulation um, maybe a six mil poly vapor barrier and some gypsum board now we understand that uh, that code is the minimum and high performance has expanded upon that and this is one not a fully all-encompassing option for it, but this is one example of a great high-performance buildup. We've got a better facade material. We've got rain screen battens, 3 8 inch to give adequate airflow for vapor evacuation. We've got permeable exterior insulation with a self-adhered high-performance weather barrier, high-quality wood sheathing, maybe even, even adding a double stud wall with blown-in insulation a smart directional vapor control layer, and some gypsum board. Now I understand that uh, some of these layers can be, um, can be assembled differently. So keep in mind that this is just one example of a high performance option. So what type of challenges do we see in the multifamily construction world? Uh, so we'll look at that by walking through these challenges using Finch Cambridge as a case study. Uh, and, and we'll talk about how they were able to solve some of these, some of these problems th through their process. So what is Finch Cambridge? Finch Cambridge is a six-story residential building just outside of Boston in the city of Cambridge that is, has 98 units in it. And at the time, it is New England's largest multifamily passive house building as of 2020. And it's also Cambridge's largest new construction, 100% affordable housing development in 40 years. Uh, so not only are we building uh, a great affordable housing development, but it is passive house. Uh, and this is, this is something that is um, extremely important to the people that, that need affordable housing is also affordable utilities. So the challenges in the region, and this is going to span any uh, highly developed um, metropolitan area, space is at a premium. You know, it's hard to find space to develop on and also maximizing the space within the building once you find that space is really important. Affordable housing shortage, uh, all the big cities are facing this one. Um, and this is, a, this is a really, really big problem for, for local governments. Uh, increasingly strict building codes requiring uh, better energy efficiency uh, for new construction. So that requires uh, more training on uh, with the trades. And then of course, higher operating costs. And we've seen that over the last couple of years, especially uh, energy prices have skyrocketed. Uh, so this is becoming a more and more important mission for us to undertake uh, at, at helping to reduce the burden, especially on the people that need it the most. So wherever you find land that is at a premium, the cost of construction dramatically increases. Um, and that is, that's compounded because you can't charge for non-livable non space. So in a typical multifamily building, you're gonna see on average about 15% of the total volume of that building is lost to the mechanical rooms, uh, common areas. So like hallways, elevators, exhaust shafts, HVAC equipment, all of that stuff. Uh, so there's a lot of wasted space inside that building that we're not able to maximize and capitalize on. Also, you see high utility costs. So if we look at a, a mid to high rise multifamily building envelope or building, roughly 6% of the revenue is going to utility costs each year. So if we were to say break that down a little further, using Finch Cambers as an example, so in this instance, heating, cooling, and water is paid for by the building owner for all 98 units. Now we know that that cost is one of these things where if we can get the building owners on board, they're more likely to adopt these standards. So if we look at say the median rent in Boston, as of 2020, I'm sure this is a bigger number now um, with, the, with the cost of, of, of housing and rent skyrocketing along with utility costs. So in 2020, the median rent was $2,450 per month for a one bedroom apartment. Now a building owner, 
who might be providing heat and hot water is going to say, all right, we've got uh, a monthly rent of $2,450. We've got 12 months. That's $29,400 in income per unit. Now, we have 98 units in Finch Cambridge. I understand that Finch Cambridge has more than just single family or single bedroom units, but you know we're keeping it single bedroom uh, just for round numbers. So we say that we got 29,000 times 98 units equals about $3 million in annual rental income. So 6% of that that's going to utilities is going to be roughly $175,000 in revenue each year that's going to utilities. So for an affordable housing development that might be providing these types of services to their residents, these are big numbers that could convince them to go in the direction of, of a passive house building where, where they can recuperate uh, some of those util utility costs each year. Now, before Finch Cambridge was built, um, there was a, a local college, uh, Wheaton College, who built a new dormitory, all Passive House uh, standards, Passive House certified. It's four, four stories, 45,000 square feet, 178 undergrad beds in, in this building. And within its first year of operation, it had already cut its ex operating expenses by 50% for that one residence hall. So that's a huge, huge boom to them. And then they're also really, really happy with it because not only is it a boon to them as far as being able to you know, recuperate some of those operating expenses, but they're proud of it. The students are proud of it. The community is proud of it. So this is a really great, great um, way for people to be, to be happy with this standard. On top of that, again, um, incentives uh, are important for increasing the, the adoption of high performance building envelope. And in Massachusetts, MassSave has a really, really great incentive program for Passive House. Now, wherever you are in the country, each, each state has their own incentive program. Uh, but I would encourage you, if you don't have an incentive program in your state, to take a look at Mass Saves and, and really do some advocacy to get uh, the local government kind of on board with, with things like this. So you can see here that with Mass Save, your feasibility study is covered 100% up to $5,000. Your energy modeling is covered 75%, $500 per unit max. $20,000 maximum um, incentive for the energy modeling of these buildings. Your pre-certification is $500 per unit, and there's no maximum to that. So that's $500 per unit. So you've got 200 units, you get $500 for each of those units if you are pre-certified. Now, once you get to the certification part, that's where the big bucks start rolling in. So if you do everything properly, if everything is well done and well assembled and you're able to get certified, you will get $2,500 per unit with no max incentive. And then your net performance bonus. So if you're a, your, your net performance is at 75 cents per kilowatt hour and $7.50 per therm. So let's take a look at what that, mat, that net performance bonus would look like in Massachusetts. So we see here that we have a energy savings for this for this building, this example building uh, at 422,000 kilowatt hours. We're gonna multiply that by our 75 cents and we're gonna see that we get an incentive of $317,152. And for the natural gas, we've got an energy savings of 6,724 therms, multiply that by the 750. And we've got a, uh, an incentive of 50,400 for a total of $367,000. So let's move on to see how that total incentive package looks like. So we've got our feasibility study paid at 5,000. We've got our energy modeling cost share at 20,000. Our pre-certification, this example building is 100 units for round numbers. Pre-certification, 500 a unit, 50,000. Certification, 2,500 a unit, 250,000. I have those in a red box 
because that 300,000 will come off of the net performance bonus. And that's how you see the 67,582 there. Because in this previous slide, we had a total of 367,582, our net performance, and that's the net, is the performance bonus here minus your pre and post certification um, incentives. So the total for this for, for this 100 unit development is gonna be almost half a million dollars. That's a big incentive number. And that is why Massachusetts is really, really rocking and rolling on these multifamily building envelopes or these multifamily building typologies with passive house. Because uh, for example, SEGA right now, I think we're working on six or seven under construction right now. Um, and they're all, uh, they're all 40 plus units. So this is a very, very big, um, it's a very big thing in the market right now. So what about code design? Well, there are some pros to code design. Most trades are gonna be familiar with this assembly. These materials are commonly found. You, know, you can walk into any uh, building material store and pick anything you need off the shelf. And they're more inexpensive to build. I wouldn't say necessarily they're inexpensive by today's standards, but they're more inexpensive than, than some other types of, uh, types of construction practices. Unfortunately, they come with a few more cons than they do pros. The materials are often lower quality. You see that uh, typically when you go in, you're just buying whatever's the least expensive for a code-based building versus uh, a high-performance building wouldn't do that. They're not as energy efficient. Codes are getting stricter, I understand that, but they are nowhere near as energy efficient as a, say, a passive house. They can be prone to moisture damage. They don't have the detailing and the planning that goes into a high performance building. The occupant comfort can be low as the uh, detailing and planning is, leaves it prone to moisture damage. They're also prone to air leakage. And any of you that have ever lived in a Northern climate can attest to sitting in front of a, a, a drafty window in the winter is not comfortable. They often have high maintenance and operating costs, high maintenance costs due to the, the lower quality materials and the, uh, the detailing that's not quite as intricate and the operating costs for all those utilities that are literally just going right out the window, right out that leaky window. Because of all these factors, they have lower durability lower resiliency. So let's say if we, we lose power in a northern climate in the wintertime, these buildings tend to cool off quite quickly. <coughs> but if we talk about high performance, they're quieter inside. Uh, we did a, uh, a big, we went to a big project in, um, there's a, a big like roundabout in, in Charlestown, Massachusetts, right outside the city and we were talking with the project team outside the building, we couldn't hear each other talk. So we walked inside and it was dead silent. Couldn't hear any of the dump trucks, the tractor trailers, any of the horns honking, any of that stuff uh, on the inside. It was, it, was, it was astounding how much quieter they are. The indoor air quality is much higher. We are filtering the indoor air through uh, an ERV or an HRV uh, we're bringing that air in intentionally and filtering it for highest, uh, for really good indoor air quality. And because these buildings are so thoughtfully planned and detailed, they have a much lower risk of moisture damage. They're also very resilient. Some passive houses don't even need heating in the wintertime. They're able to be heated by the occupants, by um, you know, whatever's going on inside the house, the computers, hair dryers, candles, all that stuff. So if you lose power in the wintertime, you're probably gonna stay warm. <clears throat> they are also much more durable due to all of this thoughtful planning and detailing. Energy efficiency is, is, is a big part of Passive House. And all of that results in improved occupant comfort and lower maintenance and utility costs. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't a couple of cons that, that you could find. They are on average, roughly 2% more expensive to build. Some have come in under the cost of code construction, others exceed the cost quite a bit. It depends on 
um, I would say, the uptake of this type of building topology. The more people that are getting into it, the less these buildings cost to build. Um, so you'll typically see them be more expensive where people are less familiar with that design type. They do take more time planning, but that more time planning also saves time on the construction end as, as you're more prepared for what you see uh, in, the, in the plans. They can be harder to source materials. A lot of these materials uh, may be coming from Europe. Uh, there aren't currently as many North American manufacturers of these types of materials that we'd like to see. More and more are coming on board, but um, some of these materials need to be planned for in the long uh, in the long term to make sure that they have time to make it uh, halfway across the world. And it does require a, a, a more skilled labor force. Uh, they need to understand the drawings better. They need to uh, they need to be able to understand the details better and how to execute those details. Um, and that's that's really important with the the education uh, part of this this whole initiative. So on that education of the initiative, let's talk about how to plan for a multifamily building envelope, a high performance multifamily building envelope. One of the first steps when you're thinking about what's gonna go into your building would be to choose a manufacturing partner. The proper manufacturing partner can provide a lot of technical data. There's nobody on the planet that will know more about the product than the person who manufactures it. And a good manufacturing partner, when involved early, will be able to provide a lot of support through both the design and construction process, as well as training. We offer a lot of different support options. We have a lot of different digital and print resources. You can find system guidelines, cut sheets, tech data sheets, all kinds of stuff on our website under the download section. Uh, we also have a lot of these guidelines in print. That way, when we're out on site, um, the contractors have something in their hands that they can look through to make sure that they're getting the details right. We also have compatibility testing and approval letters. We understand that we're not always going to be the only manufacturer that's, that's keeping the building airtight. Uh, we want to test that our products are going to play well with others. Uh, especially if it's, it's something new or, or a different detail or a new product that's coming on the market. Um, so we can, we can definitely send that to our labs with about six to eight week lead time to, to properly test both mechanical and chemical compatibility. We're also fortunate that we are our own manufacturer. So we can custom manufacture materials. So if there's a specific building detail that requires a specific size or format, we can do that with the appropriate lead time. So material selection is also, once, you, once you've got your manufacturing partners chosen, material selection is going to be big. We need to understand what materials are interacting. Make sure that they're chemically compatible, mechanically compatible. Make sure that they're designed for air tightness. In this picture over here, we see that that we've got a, a pipe that's coming up through the pathophos envelope that needed to be air sealed. The initial, the initial plan for that was um, some six mil poly and just some tape that was laying around the job site. Not designed for air tightness, was not sticking to the concrete and not to the pipe very well. Uh, so we were able to come up with a solution for that and that's through uh, some planning and proper material selection. Design for air tightness. These are the materials. This is where we get into a little bit about the materials that we make uh, that will help these buildings become air and watertight. Uh, this is the MyVES 500 SA. This is what was on Finch Cambridge. This is what they used. Um, and the reason they used it is that it has high adhesive strength in all seasons. It doesn't matter what, whether it's the middle of summer or the middle of winter. No primer required on any of the design substrates. So the substrates on Finch Cambridge, for example, dense glass, plywood, and CMU. We were able to stick to all three of those substrates without transitioning from one material to another with this product, which made the installation much easier and much more successful. 
It's also a very durable material. It's tear resistant and it's got an easy to remove split release liner on the back. And that's actually a big thing because I've used some other materials uh, and the split liner can be very difficult to work with and very frustrating. And here is a great picture of that in action. And on this picture, you can also see our wig glove tapes. Wig glove is, has a very, very high adhesive strength. Again, both hot and cold temperatures. This tape is also semi-permeable. So damp substrates can dry through the tape and drying is really, really important with these types of, of, of buildings. And again, the split release on four inch or wider rolls to make the application as easy as possible. And this is uh, the roof sheathing taped and sealed continuously on Finch Cambridge with wig glove. And then Fench from 430. This has high adhesive strength and high and low temperatures. This is a pretty common uh, reoccurring uh, feature of our materials. No primer required for masonry. That's a very, very important uh, point here with a robust fleece back carrier. So it's able to be very thin, yet extremely, extremely strong and durable. So this is where you will see that they connect this back into a CMU substrate. And then on the inside, we have another Fentrum IS20. So that's going to be, you'll see in a picture here in a moment, this is typically used to seal windows to the rough opening on the interior. So that's why this says immediate seal over the entire surface versus a backer rod and sealant. Once you apply this tape, there's no cure time. It's immediately sealed. You put it on, you are done to move on to the next step. It has a pre-fold at 5 eighths. So you can see here in the picture, these little these little pre-folds here, uh, I'll show you right here. So these little pre-folds are always 5 eighths of an inch. And that is important because typically these get applied to the face of the window, whether on the inside uh, or if you use our exterior version. And 5 eighths is a common trim size that will hide the tape. So we don't have to worry about the tape being visible once it's finished. And then the protruding backing strip is tear proof and easy to remove as well. And here is a picture of a really well detailed interior window seal. So it is completely sealed, uh, both air and vapor tight on the interior as well as the exterior. Now that we know what material is gonna go into the job, we need to look at the details. Look at the sequencing. So what is the construction sequence? How are we going to maintain the continuity of this air barrier? Who's going to be responsible for it? What trades are gonna be coming in contact with that air barrier? And who is responsible for each part of that build? And also planning for the transitions. Uh, you might be able to do something now at, during framing with a, with a membrane that makes things easier in the long run. So right here, you can see this red line going through, that's our interior vapor control layer. Well, how do we get that to go around the floor joist, the rim joist, the base joist? That's gonna be pre-planning, pre-stripping in pieces of membrane. Otherwise, you're gonna be up under that floor joist trying to tape each joist and that's gonna be a nightmare. So some pre-planning, having materials on site, understanding who's gonna be responsible for pre-installing this membrane around the rim joist is going to be key to making it easier further down the road. We offer these types of services. We are happy to meet virtually or in person to go through different tricky details that you might have, help you try to reduce the complexity of the details and kind of help you try to understand where in the sequence you could place different materials to save a lot of time and frustration in the long run. <clears throat> Some details to think about are your parapet, your roof to wall transition. So you can see here, uh, we've got this material here, tying into the temporary vapor, or the vapor control layer at the roof. So there's the air barrier continuity here. This is no longer part of the, the thermal envelope. So we just come up here and now we just have to deal with this as a weather barrier. The continuity is here. 
the flashing integration. So if you're doing brick, you know, you have these relieving angles here. You typically need to integrate some type of through wall flashing into that. Get this membrane coming up here, apply the relieving angle, get your through wall flashing, and then bring everything shingled properly uh, for, this, for this transition. Substrate integration. So we can see over here, this is, this is very similar to what Finch Cambridge has. We've got a CMU wall, we've got dens glass, we've got plywood. So understanding all of these different substrates and how to, how to plan for them, how to integrate the different materials properly into them is going to be key. Your foundation to wall integration. This is a huge air infiltration point as stack effect pulls air and vapor up through the building. It's got to come in somewhere. The cold air is lowest to the building. So it's being sucked in at your foundation to wall integration. So understanding a good detail for the foundation to wall integration is important. All right, so we've got all our details. We've got all our products figured out. Uh, we're well planned. Now we need to know how we're going to test this building because we can't do all this without testing. We need to test to make sure that we've done everything, that we're hitting our goals. So we need to know who's responsible for testing. Is it gonna be the consultant? Is it going to be the general contractor? Are we hiring uh, someone else to do that? Understanding what the time requirements are. For these bigger buildings, you know, we're doing compartmentalization tests on specific units randomly throughout the build. And then there's the whole building test. So understanding how long these tests take, when they're gonna be performed throughout the build process and how long they take is important. And then how or what you should test. So typically, obviously, we need a blower door test, but there's also window water test, window air tightness tests. Um, there's all kinds of different verification tests that go into these higher performance building envelopes. Our recommendation, we know this isn't always going to be feasible, but our recommendation is test one, you get your primary air barrier isolated. So if your window openings are already cut out, seal those off with some plastic. If your windows are up, seal those off with some plastic or leave the sheathing over them and, and go about it that way. But isolating the primary air barrier and testing your air tightness at that point will help you be able to find leaks in that air barrier easily. Test two, after the window's installed, well, we just cut a big hole in our air barrier and then we sealed it back up. We wanna make sure we did that well. Test one is a nice to have test. Test two is absolutely where you should, at the very, very latest, do your first test. Then test three, after the finish is installed, we wanna make sure that everything we did on test one and test two hasn't been affected by trim and finish carpentry. So we wanna make sure that everything is verifiable at the end of the build um, and that we haven't lost any air tightness to any other trades in interacting negatively with the air barrier. What you should never do is your first test should never be after the finishes are installed. Because if you have missed your goal, you're either gonna just live with that and not get your certification bonuses, or you are going to have to spend a lot of time and money going back and chasing down leaks and hoping that you can find them and fix them. Never do your first blower door test after the finishes are installed. All right, next thing we gotta do is we wanna build a mock-up. These are really, really important for bigger buildings because they help the project team understand what products are going where and how they're integrating. They help the team that's going to be there be trained on how these details are going to be built, how they're going to be performed. They help also maintain some level of accountability. So once this mock-up is built, you're gonna have the architects gonna be there, the consultants are gonna be there, the general contractor is going to be there. The subcontractors that are interacting with any of the building envelope uh, ideally will be there. And we're going to put this up. We're going to say, these are the details. We're going to figure out, maybe we're going to see some problems here and be able to adjust there. But this is going to be documented. This is a documented process. 
that is going to stay on the job site until this building is done. So nobody can say, well, I didn't know I had to do that. Well, there's a big giant example of it right over there. So this is, this is great for, for a, lot of, a lot of things. And you know, I would even say that even large single family homes could benefit from some type of small mock-up just to be able to, to, to understand that. So all of this is done. Now we're building, the building is going great. And we have achieved our air tightness of 0 0.39 ACH 50. Now, one thing I will add as a little anecdote, uh, they were afraid that they were going to miss their number because the blower door wasn't going well on the first time, on the first go around. Come to find out, their plumbing traps were dry. So the blower door was sucking air through the plumbing trap. So if you're going to do a blower door test on a multifamily building, make sure all your plumbing has water in it. Um, once they got the plumbing filled up with water the way it needed to be, uh, that's when they hit their number. So that's a, that's a really big important thing as you're going through your, your blower door test and you know, kind of not understanding like all the compartmentalization worked. I don't understand why the whole building isn't working. And then you find empty plumbing traps. Uh, so that is, that is that. That is, um, that's all I have for that presentation. I look forward to answering questions. Um, I look forward to uh, speaking with any of you. There's my contact information uh, for any, any questions that I have after this event as well. So feel free to take a screenshot of that, take a picture of that, write that down. Um, one thing that's very important for me, for you guys to understand is that we are super, super interested in supporting your projects, not just selling you materials, of course, that's important too, but supporting the projects. Our primary focus is that you reach your goals and we will work very hard to make sure that happens. So that is my time for this presentation. I will now turn it back over to Zach, who I think is going to uh, handle all the Q&A and throw in different things at me. That's right, Ken. Thank you so much. It, everyone, if you wouldn't mind uh, unmuting yourself and, and giving Ken a hand for this excellent presentation, that would be fantastic. Ken, well done. Bravo, bravo. Thank you. Indeed. So we're going to go into questions. And please, everyone, uh, uh, mute yourselves again. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go into questions. And here, I'll, I'll um, share the uh, queue here. Shruti James, you are up first. You had a question about the incentive program. So it looks like Shruti has has uh, left the meeting. So Shru, her question was, what is the what baseline is the incentive calculated against? Um, uh, is it current code? And my understanding is that it really, the incentive is based on whether, whether it's a pass cost or not, correct? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Cool. All right. So Jeff back, you are up next. Jeff is already gone. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> I need, I, my, that's, that's my faux pas. I should be checking first. So Jeff, uh, Jeff's question again, I think was during the same portion of the, of the presentation. And he asked, is this considered performance-based contracting? I would say not necessarily. I mean, the, this is, the, for example, this is the subcontractor's first, first passive house that they had ever built. Uh, I don't think there were uh, any requirements. I see John Roddenheiser's on here. He might be able to, to answer to that because um, he was part of that project team. Uh, I don't know if that was anything to do with performance-based contracting or not, but um, as far as I know, this is just standard, standard out to bid um just like any other construction project excellent okay next up is harvey harvey you had a couple of questions thank you uh zach great uh, presentation yeah. ken i have a couple uh what did the cambridge project for the energy or project sorry the cambridge project project for the energy savings over 10 years that's question one and then question two did the cost end up being two percent higher than the than a conventional build that's so, subsection one of my questions. Sure. Uh, so the first question, I, I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, 
Um, that would be a, a great. Uh, that would be a great um, question for uh, maybe Michelle over at Icon Architecture. Michelle Apigian over at Icon Architecture might be able to answer that for you. Um, the second question, I believe, after incentives, they came in slightly under the cost of code construction. Prior to incent, no. John's shaking his head. No, I heard that from someone. Uh, Three percent. All right. So three percent. Uh, 3% overcode construction. Okay. But it's true that, um, I mean, Be Beverly Craig from, from Massachusetts uh, Clean Energy Center, Mass CEC, uh, corroborates that that generally the 2%, I mean, you know, it can, it can range between 1% and 3%, but that 2% premium for multifamily buildings in Massachusetts and for pass files. And um, notes that uh, the the main reason for that is that there's just superior ventilation systems um, in the buildings, and in the in light of COVID, um, that seems like a pretty smart um, investment. Yeah, and I will say one of the one of the things that typically gets left out when you're when you're planning for costs on high performance is, yeah, your building envelope is probably going to cost a little bit more, but your mechanicals cost a hell of a lot less. Um, so you know you sit you're you're starting. You know your your costs are going up and up and up and up, and then you save, uh, you save a, a lot of that in the the mechanical uh, avenue. So, okay, my yeah. second my second question it's a it's a little bit of a left fielder. Um, first of all, I just want to say that having the mock up there and leaving it there, if you have room on the site, that's a great idea. Hopefully, yep. the weather during that eight or ten month build doesn't uh, degrade it. Um, but the other thing was, it's I, I'm always amazed that we don't have something that's standardized for windows, specifically insulation on the inside of the windows. Is Sega ever gonna come up with a product that's sort of like a tape insulation at the same time that tapes the gap? Because this is something that I always find, people are talking about, you, well, you can use caulking or you can use a, uh, uh, some type of baffle or you can try to stick it, stick some insulation in there. Well, obviously we don't use um, spray foam, but just thought there has to be something that would work if you have a standardized opening that it would slide in and close it off and then it would be taped. So I'm just curious if you guys have even thought of that at all. Yeah, I mean, I, there's, a, there's, there's a few companies out there that do manufacture like an, a low or, or some type of expanding foam tape. Uh, they come with their own challenges. You know, you got to get them on the window and get the window in before they start expanding. Um, and then you gotta, you gotta make sure that they're tight to the corners cause they don't typically make a 90 degree corner. They make a, a slightly rounded corner. Uh, so you could use two different systems and it, like in lieu of a spray foam, you can put an expanding foam tape to insulate. And then especially with passive house windows, having those clip installs, they don't tightly fit around those. Then you could tape the outside. Um, I don't. I can't speak to whether or not that uh, Sega would be developing a tape like that uh, or is in the plans uh, because oftentimes they just keep very tight lipped and then they, they say, hey, check out this new product. And then we're like, oh, cool. Didn't know you were working on that for five years. So <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the new products are often a surprise for us. So <laughs> fantastic. All right, Harvey, is that, are you set? Well, he didn't answer the Harvey question. He didn't have an answer for it, so I'm out. <laughs> Fair enough. So you're 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 somewhat satisfied, but not entirely satisfied. Is what well, you're as good as I could ask, obviously. <laughs> you know that, Zach. Yeah, I, I like Thanks, to think Harvey. I know everything, but <laughs> well, the, the, the Harvey question is that for for a year on Passive House yeah. Accelerator, for two days, two nights, I would always ask, "What's the payback? <laughs> or how much did that cost? How long does it take to pay it back?" How much is it per square foot? And uh, just, you know, Lloyd Alter would lose his mind every single week. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna write those down. Next time I do a presentation, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have some numbers just for you. The That's Harvey right. questions. Harvey, Harvey, Harvey <laughs> question ready to go. All right, thank you. Thanks, Harvey. All right, so, oops, I, I meant to um, do the cue to everyone, but I sent it to just one individual. Sorry about that. So up, up next is Daniel Clark. Okay, so I'm curious uh, for all these multifamily buildings. How do how did this one in particular deal with compartmentalization? Did he did you do a suite by suite, floor by floor? Or did you do the whole building at once? Uh, I believe it was suite by suite. Um, as far as I know, we didn't have much to do with the compartmentalization of 
units. Uh, so that's not really my 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 knowledge point on that building. Um, no, John, not... John's giving me some finger signs. I don't know what they mean, but <laughs> <laughs> but I know they did compart. They did do a whole building blower door test at the end, of course. Um, but there was compartmentalization. I just don't know if it was floor by floor, suite by suite. Hi, I'd like to add to that quickly. Uh, yes, we did do a full blower door and multiple ones on the entire building, propping every door open. But we also did compartmentalization testing. That was a requirement of Passive House. And we used sampling protocol to uh, achieve that, sampling you know, 10% of the units. Well, thanks, John. Hey, John, you, you just uh, um, provided a really nice comment about Sika. Do you want to share that now? Yeah, um, I just wanted to reach out and say, too, that I, I was the verifier on the project. It was exciting. It was my first multifamily. But, uh, you know, it was early in winter, and they built the mock models. And I won't say who was the previous air barrier uh, specified company that did it. But it was, you know, I went there and started pulling and pulling. And I've certified a number of residential units in Passive House. But I was really wondering how we were going to achieve Passive House on this multifamily building six stories up as you saw pictures uh, and just you know after coming back a week later with the architect and going over the details that were executed on the mock model it was just easy to just pull something and it would come off or it wasn't really stuck on and this and that and I said you know how do I feel about achieving passive houses I said it probably will be very difficult. And I'd be lying to you if it said we can achieve passive house using this. I don't see how it could have happened. Um, so, you know, that's when we brought Ken in and, you know, I've used their products on smaller buildings. And uh, this, was a, this was a great testing uh, building to test this out on. And it worked perfectly. Um, any of the problems we had with the uh, air loss and infiltration or exfiltration, depending, because we had to test it both ways, um, was not because of the air barrier. It was because of execution of other things. And you know, like I said, traps were one of them and elevator shafts and things and, and uh, trash chutes and things of those nature. Uh, just finding all these things to seal them up properly to, to perform a test in a building that size. Took, it took a team of guys uh, to do it, and, uh, but it was exciting. We had COVID going on, so we had to roll in on a Sunday and we had to hit it hard. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't too much later that the buildings were being uh, rented out on us too. So we were finalizing testing while people were starting to move in. So it was, uh, it was a challenge, but Sega made that happen as far as the, the mock models went. We put them on there and boy, they were much, much better. They, they stood the pull test and the, the water tests on windows and whatnot. Um, it was really a game changer for that building to achieve passive house. And it, it was great. Thanks to Ken. Awesome. Thanks, John. Nice testimonial I there. Promise I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> you paid him in a successful project. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So I think we are, where are we? We are, uh, Laura is, it, wait, have we done Daniel? Uh-oh, I've lost track now. <laughs> I'm good. All right, good. Uh, Laura, you're up next. Hey, um, my question, uh, so I'm in New York State. I was wondering if anyone was familiar with the incentive programs from New York State and if there's any available for a single family and if there's differentiation between new build versus renovation uh, for either multi or single family. Yeah, I know that's, um, that's something that we have a rep in Brooklyn. And he keeps track of all of that. Uh, so if you want to, um, if you want to send me an email or text message or a call, I can get you in contact with Jay down in New York. Um, uh, yeah, he, he stays up to date on all of that. I think he, he even does some presentations on different incentive programs that they have available. So I can get you in touch with him and he can tell you all about what they have in New York. Okay, thanks. Sure. Yeah, a great question. And, and I know from multifamily buildings, there's a really exciting program called the Buildings of Excellence program. 
that that is actually round yeah. three is underway right now. They're they're accepting applications in, until I think July sixteenth. So I'm gonna I'm gonna include. I know you mentioned um, a single family, but this this is relevant for for multifamily, um, and it's a, it's an awesome program. And then there's the carbon neutral buildings program there, and I think that is what would be relevant to single family. I'm I'm less familiar with with that one, um, so but I will I'll include a link here um, to just to, that might be a place to start digging a little bit. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Okay, up next is Jason Saul. All right, hello, I'm a contractor and I got some questions for you, Ken, about the water resistive barrier and the air barrier. So um, looking at that wall assembly that you sent, um, are both those barriers, the Sega barriers you show, do they self seal for fasteners? Yes, they're self gasketing, yep. Okay, and then is, I assume the primary air barrier is the interior barrier that you show up against the framing after the insulation's in, the blown in insulation is in. Is that correct? Uh, no, on this building, the primary was the exterior barrier. Okay. Okay. And so, um, good, because if it was interior, I was wondering how you seal around can lights, for example, and, and all of that. But if it's at the exterior, um, being new to passive house construction, your, your ceiling on the outside, isn't moisture moving from the interior um, and getting, could it get stuck in the wall or the, the interior barrier stops any vapor from entering the wall assembly? Right, so in the Northern climate, typically your vapor drive is from inside to out. Vapor right. is primarily developed on the interior in a cold climate. Um, but depending on your wall buildup, so ideally you're getting more and more permeable materials to the exterior. So that way exterior moisture has a tendency to dry faster as it gets further out. Um, so it's not, you don't want it the other way around where it's less permeable as you get out because then you are trapping moisture in the wall assembly. Um, there, are, there are membranes available that can regulate the flow of moisture into the wall assembly. Uh, the flow of water vapor into the assembly, not bulk moisture. <laughs> bulk moisture is a is a whole different problem. But uh, yeah, there are, we have we have membranes available for for regulating uh, water vapor in the assembly. Okay, I guess can you just sum up then? Uh, I, I just haven't used a, a a vapor barrier at the inside, right mm -hmm. under the drywall finish. Yep. What is the point of that in the passive house construction then? Uh, that just just that it's just to to, to keep excessive moisture from entering the wall cavity faster than it can dry out. So okay. we want the we want to make sure that no moisture is 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 entering the wall cavity in a, at a rate that is faster than its drying capability. Got it. And that's more necessary in a northern climate less I come in the Bay Area San Francisco Bay Area so there's not much vapor drive happening here so yeah. In, a, in a milder climate, is that layer skipped in a typical assembly? I mean, it's, it's, I will, I will, I'll be honest with you, it's skipped uh, even in New England um, quite often. Um, okay. We have, we have, we have the ability to calculate for that for you. Um, oh, good. So, yeah, we have, uh, you know, our calculations are, are, are free of service that we offer to our customers to, to see that your wall is going to be vapor and moisture safe. Okay. And uh, last question, thank you everybody. Last question, I don't know if we can mention other people, but in, in this market, we do a lot of Henry Blueskin for our WRB. What are the virtues of, of your SEGA products over what we buy at all the lumber yards here? Yeah, I mean, the, you, you, have a, you have a pretty good climate to build in. So you're, uh, you're not as susceptible to the cold weather. That's typically where uh, we're going to, we're going to adhere better in colder weather. Uh, our, our adhesives are fully acrylic, non, uh, non off gassing. There's no, um, harsh chemicals in the, in the adhesives or anything like that. Uh, so they're designed to last, uh, a, a longer time than say a solvent based adhesive, uh, would. So they maintain their adhesive qualities for, for, for generations, not just for, not just for years. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, you have a lot of great options uh, available to you in, in the California market. So, um, you know, the, where we'll excel is, is those two things and that we, we do have a, a little bit thicker of a membrane. It's a little bit more resistant to, to damage and things like that. Great. Thank you. Sure.
All right, excellent. So next up we have Mary Hahn. Mary, are you, do you want to ask that question? Hi. So basically the wall assembly in a uh, yeah, Eden, Utah, near Powder Mountain, uh, climate building, 6 feet dry, I believe it is. And, um, you know, I, I get nervous about the wall assembly if it is that you're using, you know, zip R sheathing with that nice, you know, insulated uh, layer behind the uh, sheathing uh, between the studs and the sheathing. And then if it is that you want to use rock wool on the outside because it's acrylic sealed on the seams, already has a weather resistant barrier. And then, you know, siding, I'm just trying, you know, and then where do I place the rain screen? I, I get confused on that wall assembly that if I want to put a rain screen in it, but I want, you know, Huber zip R sheathing, I want rock wool exterior, I want a rain screen, and then, you know, and I need my siding. I'm trying to figure out the order and layer of that and uh, for the siding to be uh, metal. Yeah, so typically what we see, especially when we're using exterior rock wool insulation is the rain screen would go, um, the rain screen would go outside of the rock wool. Uh, so whether that's, you know, using furring strips, some type of, um, some type of ripped plywood, uh, but the rain screen would go outside the rock wool, typically. Okay, so like a dimple mat would be fine? Uh, yeah, I mean, as long as you, you can, as long as you can get air movement uh, over top of the the most permeable surface, and okay. behind your behind your cladding, and that's going to do good. That's going to do wonders for your cladding as far as staying uh, staying uh, healthy. <laughs> so, Huber Zip R sheathing, uh, acrylic tape, rock wool, rain screen, and then siding. Correct. <laughs> oh, oh, one last thing. Um, under uh, rigid uh, rigid foam insulation underneath the slab for a thermal break, um, I have been trying to figure out um, a specific product, like which one of good quality to go under a slab uh, for the thermal break. Uh, I'm not. I see. A, I see a lot of different ones. A, a lot of different EPS, XPS that go under there. Uh, Rockwell's been doing actually a lot of under slab. Um, insulation. So uh, you have a lot of different options for, for your under slab. Um, and uh, I'm not really sure which brands are, are considered the best uh, for, the, for that application. Can I, can I jump in, Ken? Can you maybe just have a quick conversation? Maybe it'll help some people just to talk about how you tie in because you did talk about the stack effect and how you tie into your foundation and how to seal that off. And maybe if you have a stem wall, maybe this is just a good quick introduction for that and it may answer mary's question irrespective of whether it's eps or not yeah for our tie our tie-in is just is 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 relatively simple we go uh two inches onto the concrete and then tape up onto the sheathing um that's it's quite it's very very likely that it's the simplest solution on the market um as far as is making sure that that connection between the the, the sheathing and the foundation is airtight uh, I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of different details where you're trying to bring the this the 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 15 mil poly vapor barrier up and over the concrete and un, under the uh, the the rim uh, under the sill plate and then up the wall and then taping that all off, and it becomes a, a nightmare to try and seal all of that um, versus just you know, great that the that the the 15 mil poly goes over the uh, over the concrete and under the under the sill plate for for capillary break, uh, but after that, just just tape from see uh, tape from the concrete to the sheathing and call it a day. Don't make it harder. Uh, my my only other question is that um, so I use sign because I actually manage pretty well, and but uh, this is being recorded as I understand, right? Yep. Uh, trying to figure out how to set up the closed caption because as much as I'm managing. Does it mean that I'm catching everything? I have to fill in gaps of what I, you know, can't hear. We'll, we'll make sure that we provide captioning for this. Okay, right, thank yep. you. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, Mary, for your questions. Um, so next up, we have John Snell. Um, hi. <clears throat> Thanks for taking my question. Um, with uh, insulation, uh, like EPS under the slab, uh, do you put a water barrier below the slab above the insulation? between slab and insulation? Or do you just put the water barrier above the slab? Uh, it's always below the slab. And um, 
you put your air barrier in the same situation? Is your air barrier and your water barrier the same, or do you put your air barrier above the slab? So the you would you can maintain continuity with the with the sub slab vapor barrier as the air barrier, um, and use that up and over the sill plate. But you don't have to turn it up the wall with the solution I just mentioned uh, with our fence room tape. You can just bring that up and under the sill plate for uh, for your capillary break and then maintain the continuity with the um, uh, fence room tape. You can also uh, understand that concrete also is an air airtight material. So you could bring your 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 vapor barrier just up the, the foundation wall a slight bit if it's if it's not just flat slab on grade, tape that off and then you know maintain your continuity to the to the concrete on the exterior with the venture tape. Okay, I'm not sure that diagram would be great there, but <laughs> uh, um, for spills inside the house, like in the bathroom or kitchen uh, floor, now you've got your uh, water seal below the, the slab, between slab and insulation. Mm -hmm. um, and so that moisture is going to go into the slab. Uh, um, are you, I guess you're assuming that it, evap it evaporates back out of the slab? Right, yeah, back out into the into the built structure. Okay. And could you describe that connection one more time between the uh, water air barrier under the slab and the, um, the sheathing or the wall? Yeah, so I'll just draw it out real quick. Thank you. Let just stay So I don't know if you can see this, but this would be like, for example, you could put the stego or whatever 15 mil barrier is going to go under the slab. It's going to go up the wall a little bit. You'll tape. I'm going backwards. I can't tell which way I'm supposed to move. So you'll tape it. You'll tape the stego here. And then at the wall to foundation connection that here's your sheathing. This is going to be a fentrum tape taped to that. Alternatively, you could run your, your 15 mil barrier up and under here, and then still tape that there. And your, uh, and your air barrier and your water barrier are the same. Yeah, so it's, well, this here is your vapor barrier, your sub slab, that's part of the air barrier system. And then this here is your weather barrier, which is also your air barrier on the outside. So you're connecting from outside to inside through here. Under the, under the mud cell. Well, oh, thank you. Sure. You're muted, Zach. <laughs> thank you. Up next is Luke McNeely. Hi, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, clarify the um, uh, point about the vapor barrier versus air barrier. Um, uh, Jason had mentioned very, uh, vapor barrier on the interior of a wall assembly. And I was under the impression that we are moving away from vapor barriers to uh, more vapor permeable air barriers, uh, controlling moisture mostly through controlling air movement. And I just wanted to make sure that uh, we aren't getting confused on uh, vapor barrier versus air barriers. Can you just speak to that for a second? Sure. I know we've already discussed it, but yeah. So, um... Uh, vapor barrier still, uh, whether whether it's a vapor barrier or not, still be, becomes a relative standard term for the industry, you know, like uh, on the, for the installers anyway, for the installers that were installing the, the, the vapor permeable air and weather barrier on the exterior of, of Finch Cambridge, they still, they still refer to it as the AVB or the air vapor barrier, which is a misnomer, but um, on the inside, yeah, we're getting away from like a six mil poly actual vapor barrier, and we're moving toward more uh, vapor control membranes or vapor retard membranes. So it'll retard the flow of vapor into the wall assembly. Um, we see that smart membranes are becoming uh, more and more common, uh, where as the humidity gets higher uh, around that membrane, they 
let more vapor through them while also maintaining air tightness. So those those types of membranes you can you can use for for air barrier continuity and vapor uh, control. So that way, uh, you know, air movement is your number one vapor carrier. So the 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 more air moves through uh, an assembly, the more um, vapor it carries, especially if it's warm warm air. So we want to first stop vapor transport into the wall cavity by stopping air movement. And then we also want to make sure that diffusion happens slower from the inside to the out by using a proper vapor control membrane when appropriate. And that's, I think that's the, that's the big, uh, the, the big caveat there when appropriate. Right. It depends. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic, Ken. I think that that uh, concludes our questions, unless anyone has one now that they'd like to pose in the chat. Um, but Ken, this has been really fantastic. Thank you for an excellent presentation. And uh, thank you everyone for being here and for uh, sp spurring on a, a really nice uh, discussion with Ken. I think there were over 130 people today at, at, at today's uh, spotlight. So it's really great to see those kinds of numbers and engagement. Um, with a really exciting uh, suite of products from SIGA and, and with, with Ken um, as a thought leader in this space. So uh, also thank you to SIGA for its support of Passbus Accelerator and, and their help in, in allowing us to do this work. So I think that, that I'm not seeing any more questions, so I think we're ready to wrap up. I don't know if Ken, if you, if you have any final thoughts you want to share with folks. Sure, yeah. Uh, first, uh, I wasn't just trying to be easy to see. I was out on a job site supporting some training <laughs> Uh, some training today, so that's why I'm wearing my wonderful high vis uh, yellow. Um, also, uh, you know, I do want to thank everyone for for some great questions, um, for for listening to me talk for a little while, um, and uh, you know, hopefully we can all work together soon. Uh, for those of you in the New England market uh, or close to New New England, we do have this wonderful facility here where we train uh, anybody that's interested in high performance on how to maintain uh, good air barrier continuity and good air barrier details. Um, so feel free to reach out if you're interested in, in a, an event like that. Those are free trainings. Um, so uh, yeah, a little plug for, uh, for my little pet project. We have our uh, high performance information or high performance education center over there. We've got some uh, different products people can learn about. Um, so it's a, it's a great facility. We put on a great show out here and uh, we're happy to host you. Excellent. Thanks, Ken. And I just um, added the, the link to our interview um, that we did with you a, a, a few months ago about the training center. Perfect. Um, so folks can dive into that a little bit as well. Awesome. Um, yeah. So I think that, I think that wraps it up, Ken. Thanks again. Have a great day. Enjoy your Thursday, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Yeah.